Thank you, brother. Good morning. Good morning. It is so good to see you all. It's great to be here this weekend. It's a, a special weekend where we remember those who sacrificed their lives for us so that we could be free. So we praise God for that. It's a beautiful picture, actually, of Christ and what he's done for us to set us free, right? Every time you come to a weekend like this as you celebrate, it's great to remember those things. Like I said, it's an honor for me to be here with you all to share about a door of hope and also to just uh, uh, look into God's word. And I'm just so thankful for your pastor, Pastor Al and Chad and Mike and Jeff, just the relationship that we've had and the time, uh, the way God has used them to just bless our ministry. We're so thankful for them. We're thankful for all of you and just your partnership uh, with the door of hope. For those of, not, that, of you that have not heard about A Door of Hope, A Door of Hope is a Christ-centered foster agency. We recruit Christian families from Bible-believing churches all across Tampa Bay in, in the hopes to engage them in the foster care crisis. And we train those families, those families specifically learn about the system of care and how they can become foster parents. But we especially want to train them to understand that the foster care system is actually a mission field right in our own backyard, a place where there's a lot of darkness, right? Especially in this whole world, there's a lot of darkness, but we want to bring the light of Christ to that darkness. And so we license those families according to the standards of the state, and they become large, a part of a larger group of Christian families that are on the same mission to bring the love and hope of Jesus Christ to children and families in foster care. And we're pretty excited because we've been doing this for about 12 years by God's grace, and about two weeks ago, we just licensed our 500th Christian foster home here in Tampa Bay. So we praise God for what he's doing. He's doing great things. So we recruit families, we train them, we license them, like I said, and lastly, we support those families. This is probably the most important part. As they're walking through this journey of foster care, we want to be there for them. We are the hands of support that they need to, to go through everything that they're going through. We hold those families up as they face the hardest things that foster care can throw at them. And we, our heart is that they keep their eyes focused on Jesus, right? As they're contending for the souls of children and families in this community. And it's not easy. Foster care is not easy. It's a hard calling, but it's transforming. It's the purest of religions and the most perfect of loves. Unconditional. This is foster care ministry, and we hope if you guys are hearing me talk right now, or if you saw the video and you're thinking, man, maybe God wants me to do something in here, we'd love to come talk to you. If you would come to the back table, Ryan and Ashland are back there. We'd love to just see how God may be connecting you to uh, a door of hope and how you can serve. Uh, we're looking for the brave, the courageous, those that are not okay with just a comfortable Christian life, but those that are sold out to Jesus and to his kingdom. We're looking for those folks. Some of those folks will come to us and they'll become foster families, which is awesome because we're on a strategic plan to license a thousand homes. We would love to see a thousand Christian families just invading the foster care system for Jesus' name. But not everyone's called to foster, right? But then there's some that are called to partner with us in prayer, that are fighting the principalities and powers that the Bible talks about with us on their knees. That's so important. We'd love for you to join us in that way. And some of our, our some people, folks here that may be called to be foster family support, where you come alongside a foster family while they're taking in a child, you're providing support and help to them in, in different ways, whatever they may, may need, whether it's a meal washing clothes, whatever it may be, just a great way for you to support a family so they know that they're not alone. So if that's you, we'd love to talk to you. So come to our table in the back. Like I said, Brian and Ashton will be there. We'd love to hear how God can use you in this way in his kingdom. Let me pray real quick. Father, I just pray for whoever you may be calling to serve in foster care ministry, Lord. I pray that you would move in their hearts, that you would give it clarity and wisdom, and Lord, that in, in some way, Lord, you would use them to bring the good news of Jesus to children in, in foster care in our community. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. A week before Easter, some close friends of mine, they faced a terrible tragedy, something no parent ever wants to go through in their life. Their 15-year-old daughter, Selah was her name, was at a dance at Calvary Christian High School in Fort Lauderdale, and she had what they called a medical emergency during that event, and she found herself in the hospital. One week, she was just this happy-go-lucky, healthy 15-year-old girl having a great time. And a week later, she was in the hospital battling for her life. And the family who we love was were praying for God to do a miracle and for God to just have mercy on this little girl. 
and they believe with all their heart that God would heal her. But on Good Friday, Selah went to be with the Lord. It was so hard. What do you do when you face a trial in your life where you've been crying out to God for a miracle, but God just doesn't show up in the way that you wanted him to show up? This morning, we're going to take a look at a particular text about a family who faced a life and death situation in their life and had hope for Jesus to show up for them. Please turn with me to John chapter 11. You've probably heard the story of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. It's a pretty well-known story. But if you haven't, I would encourage you to go back home tonight with your family just around Bible time. Just read through this story. It's a beautiful story of our resurrecting Savior. And just you're seeing glimpses of who God is through this text. And it's pretty awesome. I encourage you to definitely do that. Let's read the first six verses here. Now, a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. It was that Mary who anointed the Lord with fragrant oil and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore, the sisters sent to him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. When Jesus heard that, he said, this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that he was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was. Mary and Martha and their brother Lazarus lived in Bethany, which is just a few miles from Jerusalem. And this family was known well by Jesus. In fact, in the text, John lets us know that he loved this family. And then one day, Lazarus gets sick. And the text doesn't tell us exactly what that sickness was, but we knew it was serious from the text. And so Martha and, and Mary, they send word to Jesus that their brother is sick. And now just think about this. If, if you were somebody who had walked with Jesus like they did, wouldn't that be exactly what you would do? You would send for Jesus. So you remember, Martha and Mary have seen Jesus heal so many people. Like there was the story of that blind man. You remember Jesus went up to him, spit on that mud and, and put it on his eyes and told him to wash it off at the pool of Siloam. And he was healed. Miraculous. And then there was the lame man that had been waiting at the pool of Bethesda for 38 years to get healed. And Jesus walks up one day and says, pick up your mat and walk. And he was healed. And then maybe this is a little less known story of the nobleman's son who went to Jesus and found him and said that his son sick back home. Jesus didn't even go to his house. He just proclaimed healing on this child from where he was. And guess what? He was healed. Mary and Martha knew about this. They probably were thinking, surely Jesus would do this for Lazarus, somebody he loved so much. They knew about all these things. They knew that he was the Messiah. They knew he had the power to heal. So, of course, they send for him. Jesus, the one that you love, he needs you. But Jesus didn't come in time. In fact, the Bible says in verse 6, Jesus hears the news and he stays two more days in the place where he was. That's so weird. That text, it's so conflicting to the thought. You're like, he loves him, and so he would go. But no, the text says he stayed two more days. Have you ever been in that place? Because my friends were there recently. They lost their daughter, and they don't know why. They know this powerful God who can heal, but he didn't heal for them. And they're struggling with the why. Mary and Martha, like my friends, thought that Jesus would, would show up in a big way. But now they're facing the worst pain their hearts could ever experience. Their brother Lazarus is dead, and they are left to pick up the pieces. But John helps us understand what Jesus is thinking, because Jesus', Jesus perspective is an eternal perspective. He can see the whole horizon. So look at verse 4. It says, when Jesus heard heard that, he said, this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Our omniscient God, our all-knowing God, he knew this sickness would come. Jesus was not unaware of Lazarus. He was waiting for it. And he, and he reveals to the disciples and to us, of course, as we read the text, that Lazarus' sickness had a greater purpose. It was going to bring glory to God. And church, this is something, this is a hard thing, but this is 
one of the main things that we need to understand as followers of Christ, God is sovereign over the trials in our lives. Not only what I'm going through today, but also the where, the when, and the why I'm going through it. Mary, Martha, you need to know this was going to be for God's glory. This is good news for, for us because we all are going to face trials if we, already, if we haven't already. And we can trust that they have a greater purpose. They're not, they're not just things that happen to us for no reason. Don't believe that lie that Satan has fed us for years, that it was for nothing, that it was meaningless, because it wasn't. And it won't be. God has a purpose for allowing us to go through hard things. 2 Corinthians 4, 17 says this, For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working. Church, God is at work. For us, a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Martha and Mary are not able to see it right now. But in their struggle and their pain and the pain they were facing, God was going to be glorified. And one of the ways, in particular, uh, that he was glorified through this tragedy was it fulfilled prophecy. If you remember the story of, of, of John's disciples coming to meet Jesus, John was in prison and he had sent them to go ask Jesus, are you the Messiah or should we, should we be looking for someone else? You remember that? And then what did he tell John? Jesus was like, tell John the blind see, the lame walk, the deaf hear, and the dead are raised. That's in Luke chapter 7. This is the fulfillment of that. Isaiah had prophesied about this long before, that the Messiah would do these things. And Jesus proved that he was the Messiah through these things that he's done. Sometimes our struggles are not even about us. Like if you look at Job's life, God literally telling Satan, have you considered my servant Job? That always stuns me and almost scares me sometimes too because I'm hoping God never says, have you considered my son godly? Uh, that, I'm like, please, Lord, if, I mean, I, you're God, but please, if, if not needed. Because <laughs> we know what Job went through. We don't want to, sometimes it's so hard to think about facing all of that. Sometimes also our trials come from the consequences of our own sinful choices, right? Like Peter, he denied Christ his pride would let him put his foot in his mouth a hundred times over. And then there's David and Bathsheba, adultery, murder. There's consequences to the, the sinful choices that we make, sometimes to the third and fourth generation. But we must remember that no matter what the, caused the trials in our lives, God doesn't throw his hand up and say, I can't work with this. Everything's ruined. Not at all. No. Our sovereign God is working all things together for good. He's that powerful that he can work everything that you're doing in this room together. He doesn't need to ask your permission. He can do it. My friends in South Florida, in the midst of their darkest of moments in this life, they have chosen to trust in their good, good God. It's sometimes all we can do. We just surrender. Believer, you can trust him in your, in your trial today. Here's the second thing we need to see that we can see from this story. God, he meets us in the trials of our lives. He meets us. Look at verse 17. I'm going to read that to you. 17 through 20. It says, so when Jesus came, he found that he had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles away, and many of the Jews had joined the women around Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Now Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. But Mary was sitting in the house. Friends, our Savior is not far away when we're hurting and we're battling despair. He is with us. He knows us so well. The Bible says he knit us together in our mother's womb. He made us. And this God so perfectly meets us exactly where we need him to meet us. Sometimes it's in the midst of our anger. If you've been through a trial, maybe you struggled with what happened and you're just angry. God is so good. He meets us right there. Sometimes it's in the midst of our deepest, darkest depression. A day where you don't want to live another day. God 
God, it's so good to meet you right there, right in that moment. And sometimes he, he meets us in the midst of our unbelief, and he helps us. He helps us. He doesn't run from us. God meets with us. Take note that when Jesus comes just outside of Bethany, Martha's the one that runs to Jesus, <clears throat> but Mary does not, right? We have two different people here, two different personalities and needs. And what is so good about our Savior is that he knows us. And so he meets us both. He meets them both where they need him to meet, meet them. Martha reaches Jesus and says, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Martha's personality is one that needed answers. She wasn't going to wait. She runs to Jesus the moment she hears he's in town. For Martha, it's not, about what's, not only about what she's feeling about the situation. She needs more information. She needs to understand why this is happening. Maybe you're like that. You ask questions. You need to gather information to understand the situation. I find a lot of leaders that I meet are just like that. They seek information to understand before they act, right? Martha was like that. She takes a, she's got a take charge personality and runs to Jesus because she wants to know, why didn't you come in time to heal my brother? What's the reason? And this is how God met her in this trial. Jesus gives her truth. He says, Martha, Lazarus will rise again. And she's like, I know, Lord. He's going to rise on the last day. I've heard you probably say that. If I believe in you or if we believe in you, we will rise on the last day. Like she's, she's gained information. She's feeding it back to the Savior that she probably got from him, right? And Jesus is like, no, Martha, you don't get it. I am the resurrection and the life. What he's, what's he trying to say to her? This is not the end of the story, Martha. I am sovereign over death, even today. It doesn't matter. It's not for the last day. I am the resurrection. Do you believe this? And that's what he's asking each and every one of us, friends. Do you believe this? Are you taking him at his word? Martha says yes and professes Christ. And you see how this interaction with Jesus, somehow it satisfies her. She doesn't have any more questions to ask him, and she goes back home. Martha needed Jesus to meet her here to help understand what was happening. Lazarus, though, is still in the grave, right? But Martha knows her Jesus is the hope of both the living and the dead. So that was Martha, and here's Mary. She's still back at the house. She hasn't left. And Mary gets a personal call from Jesus through Martha. Mary goes running the moment she hears. Mary's the emotional one. She needs Jesus to personally call her to come. She needs to know that Jesus cares about the situation, yes, but even so, more so about her. And I think it's important to note, Jesus hasn't moved yet from the same spot that he met Martha. He has not taken one more step closer. And when Mary arrives, she makes the same statement. Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. She's in the same place asking the same question, but really something a little different. What she wants to understand is how the God she loves would allow this to happen. Martha, her sister, was needing information but for Mary, it wasn't just that. She needed his comfort. She needed him to listen to her pain. And this is such a beautiful part in Scripture in the text because you see Jesus groans in his spirit as he sees her pain. He doesn't even answer her question or say a word. The Bible says he weeps with her. He weeps with her. Jesus meets her in her pain. This is what true empathy looks like. And so we have a God who is sovereign over our trials, a God who meets us in our trials, and we have a God who reveals himself through our trials. Look at verse 38 to 45. When Jesus, again groaning in himself, came to the tomb, it was a cave and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of whom was the dead, said to him, Lord, by this time there is a stench, for he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? 
And they took away the stone from the place where the dead man was lying. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me, and I know that you always hear me. But because of the people who are standing by, I said this, that they may believe that you sent me. Now, when he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he who had died came out bound, uh, hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to him, loose him and let him go. This text is powerful. It's pretty awesome when you read it and see what happened. Can you imagine being somebody who's there as Lazarus is raised from the dead? That's crazy. I'm sure you guys would just fall over in that moment. Then you got to be asking the question, because if you're there and you don't know who this is, who is this guy that just raised Lazarus? Mary and Mar- Martha knew he was a, pro- was a Messiah. Many of there thought he was just a good teacher, maybe a, a prophet. But then Jesus does the miracle, right? The impossible, something only God could do. He does it. And the Bible says that the people believed. When you see something like that, it's hard to stay the same. The supernatural took place, and Jesus, in fact, shook the, all of their very foundational thoughts of what was possible and not possible in that moment. And they had to conclude that this man was more than just a man. C.S. Lewis writes in his book, Mere Christianity, and speaking of Jesus, he says this, you can shut him, up of a, as, shut him up for a fool, you can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. Jesus didn't come with the intention of leaving us wondering who he was or what he was. He said to Martha, I am the resurrection. And Paul says to the church of the Colossians that he is the image of the invisible God. He was God Almighty. That day, many saw something supernatural take place. And guess what? They could not stay the same. Lazarus' death and resurrection caused many to believe in Jesus. How great an honor this was to be used by God to reach so many people for the kingdom of God. Let's not forget what the family had just gone through, the pain and struggle that just took place as well, right? They're still probably feeling some of that, trying to figure out what's going on. But God used his trial to reveal who he was. And that revelation brought many to Christ. Sailor's parents experienced something kind of like this, not resurrection. But the testimony of Sailor spread throughout South Florida. People were praying for her everywhere. And it felt like a revival was taking place at their high school, in the community all around them. God used this horrible event to bring 15 children that, that were at her school to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ the day before her funeral. They came to know Jesus. For all eternity, they will be saved. Is this what our parents would would have chosen? No, right? To lose their daughter? No. But they stand in awe of God and what he's doing, and they surrender to his sovereign plan. It wasn't meaningless. The seed that died is bearing much fruit. And their greatest comfort was in knowing that because Jesus rose from the dead, their Selah would one day rise again. And they testified of that over and over again at the funeral. This was their hope. And church, this is our hope as well. Our Savior is the God of resurrection and life. We have hope because of Jesus. We can trust that. Church, I don't know what you're going through today. There may be a trial that you have faced or you're just coming out of one or in one right now. And I want to encourage you that God sees you. He's with you. You're not alone. Run to him. He's calling you. He wants to be with you. Friend, he is the sovereign over that trial that you're going through today. God is at work. And you can trust him. And he's writing a testimony through your life. And you are revealing him in ways you will never know. It is our greatest honor church to be that testimony for Christ. Thank you for allowing me to share. Let me pray. Jesus, thank you that you are sovereign over everything and especially the trials that we go through. Thank you that you love us with this great everlasting love. And though 
we struggle in this life. You meet us in our pain. You meet us in our struggle. Lord, you are so compassionate, such a good friend. And Lord, we thank you that nothing is wasted, that the things that we go through, Lord, they have purpose, that people are being saved through what's going on. And we praise you and thank you for the fact that you're always at work. We give you glory and honor in Jesus' name. Amen.